I need that sugar like I need water so come on baby give it to me cause you got that I need that sugar now so now come on give it to me like sugar water cause you got that hello everyone it's part two of the CM Kozaman Arachnid Giga Special yes Following this amazing and horrible intro, now we can uh, keep going from where we last left off. In the previous video, we had studied uh, the sea scorpions, the regular scorpions, and a whole host of other minor groups that belong to the majestic family tree of arachnids. In this video, we're gonna start off with opilions, also known as harvestmen, the amazing donkey crazy zany group of spider-like creatures most of you have never heard before but before beginning please don't forget we got some rules here in cm kozman house and the house rules are number one please consider donating to me on patreon the link is below and even a dollar a day really makes a difference i know that in this age of budget concerns global war hyperinflation even uh, i know that when you even give a dollar to me you really you know give something from your own basically and every penny counts so i really respect that and i really hope you can spare that as well and now let's go the second rule is try to listen to this podcast in 1.5 or two times the speed with the YouTube speed adjustment, it makes me sound like a cooler person. And this is number two of a long series. Maybe it's going to be three parts, maybe four. I don't know. I just record it on the fly. But if you haven't watched, please also watch number one as well. Anyways, the opilions, also known as harvest men, belong to bleep, this branch of the arachnid family tree. They are proper arachnids now. There's nothing questionable about them like we had with the sea spiders and all those. Uh, traditionally, they are seen as a sister group to scorpions, but, you know, no one really knows. One thing is certain, though, the names, Scorpiones, Opiliones, they're in Latin, and they sound like strange groups of Roman gladiators. You know, gladiators had names like uh, retarius uh, people who cast a net on their enemies and so on and i don't know for some reason sounds like a gladiatorial ancient roman name now once again this is a very diverse group in fact it might be the second most diverse group after proper spiders and believe me that's gonna be a handful but there's many ways to classify them all of them have been hypothesized tried i'm just gonna go over with some major big groups and some super families that is to say i'm not gonna go over every harvestman family but i'm gonna go over super families and big groups of families i mean basically it's like uh cladistics you know this is one group under that is another group under that is another group the level of these groups kind of changes but wherever you see this kind of design, you can rest assured that the Borea Optalmi group rests under the Crypto Optalmi branch of the Opilions branch of the Arachnid family tree. Crypto Optalmi, according to most analysis, are the most derived, no, sorry, the most ancestral versions of Opilions, but some analysis consider them not so ancestral. Anyways, it's a hell of a mess. So I'm not going to go too deep into semantics of classification, but let's go. This group, Boreo Optalmi, they're almost like uh, mites in a way. They got, like all opilions, one body segment, but some lack eyes. Some have these mouth parts that really look like the mouth parts of uh, basically um, sucking mites or the kind of guy mites that give you blood disease, but these are completely different. They are not from the same group of mites at all. They are, in fact, their own group. Here's another Boreoptalmi harvestman. Once again, you got this kind of mouth parts and no eyes and a kind of overall mite-like body plan. And then this is also another one from the same group, Suzukielus sauteri. Basically, it's blind, walks about, almost looks like one of those red mites you would find in the soil. 
doesn't it? But it's not. That's the variety of life for you. It rhymes always. Another group within the Sipoptalmi group is the Scopuloptalmi group. They are kind of ganglier and chunkier. And once again, when you find these things, it's almost impossible to classify them aside from a very broad family level designation. Then there's the Sternoptalmi group, exemplified by Metasiro Sassafran Sassafrasensis. Once again, it's a soil dwelling. It's kind of larger than a mite, but just a beautiful, interesting creature, all of its own, basically. And notice that even though there's one body segment, basically from head to anus, everything is in a big, chunky meatball, there's some like segments still showing where the body parts joined up. And then in the Sternoptalmi group, you also have Ogovea, the mite-like African opilion. It's really chunky, gnarly beast. I mean, look at it. It's just, I mean, I really enjoy drawing these kinds of things with this kind of almost hexagonal plate-like arrangement. And the way these are joined is also very interesting, which is, which might be part of the reason why they're classified under a different group or genus. Then you go to the Eupnoi branch of the opilions. You see the entire second branch is changing now. It's one of the first super families or groups within the Eupnoi big group is Cadoidea, exemplified by Caddo. Caddo is a very friendly opilion. Looks like an opilion a designer might create for a DreamWorks animation or something. It's like big eyes, tiny, tidy palps and big long legs. And it's really interesting. Also, another one in this group the, is the Phalangeoidea group. And now here is where we start to get really crazy and wild with these creatures. Behold, Pantopsalis coronata, the crowned something something. Basically, those big, big ass clubs or claws you see emerging from the creature's front region. They are the same organs as these ones with this guy or even like in the more pyramid quote unquote primitive ones the same things as these ones but they have been grown to magnificent proportions in fact the group uh, the genus pantopsalis uh, has all kinds of weird crab claw like or, or almost like scorpion tail like big palps and they use them to hunt or the males use them to wrestle with each other i believe they are just unbelievable something straight from the imagination of tim burton i don't know and in the same group, you have Fosteropsalis with this enormous uh, boxing glow like chonker clothes. Once again, I mean, this thing is alive. How, how lucky are we to behold it? It's just amazing. Fosteropsalis is a big genus. There's another species, Fosteropsalis inconstans, with kind of darker, slimmer clothes. And look at all these teeth here. I mean, they're obviously specialized for a specific purpose and they're just they're just mari not much is known about these animals at all they're always from exotic parts of the world and you know usually these few photographs or specimens from in museums are all that we know them so if you want to study anything to do with zoology or arachnology the ophelions are ripe for study and i would really recommend you to pursue this if you want it as a career Another Fosteropsalis species is Fosteropsalis marplesi, with again big ass boxing glove kind of palps. And then some species in this group, of course, are not as showy. They are chunkier, they are like more olive shaped, and they got this kind of big sensor type of legs. You know, when you see these pictures, you always take this legs for granted you say ah legs but this thing is obviously stretching this leg out here on purpose maybe it's trying to feel out what's in front of it eganeus convexus and then you got another whole other a whole other group superficially similar to caddo which we saw earlier here but this one belongs to the acropsopilionoidea group and behold Acropsopilio neozelandae, the New Zealand walking eyeball thing with kind of a jaw like arrangement of its palps. So basically, they're trying, they have evolved something like the tiny jaws of a vertebrate 
independently using their digits or their legs, their face limbs. And the eye is just massive. I mean, it must be like one-fifth the body weight. Unbelievable. Anyways, more views of Acropsopilio. Now, the common difference between these guys and Caddo is the way their tails curl under. It's almost like a, a ray gun from one of those War of the Worlds walking machines. And you can see once again the amazingly cool articulation of teeth-like leg segments. Basically, it's got a little mouth made out of its arms and a little kind of boom-boom gun penis kind of reproductive organ stretching forward here. It's been bent forward. But the main difference is if you go back to the our old friend Kado, you see their butt just stretches back. It doesn't have the weird frontal curling you see with this guy. So quite interesting. Another group, Ischiropsalioidea, is represented here by Ischiroprop Ischiropsalis helvigi. Once again, with kind of like an olive oil butt body and spindly sensor limbs here and big as puncher limbs. But you can see it has a slightly different body architecture. Can't really put your finger on it, but you can see it. Another one, Ischiopropsalis species spa. Basically, it's all evolved into a little crablet, I must say. And here is a little mite taking a hitchhike ride. We'll see more of that. But you see, there's this thin flagella-like sensor limbs and these claws, which for the lack of a better word, word, make it indifferentiable, indistinguishable from a land crab, a tiny little land crab, basically. But of course, it's got nothing to do with crabs. The shape is all parallel evolution. Another species from this group is Taracus. And you see it's got this like little neat horn here. And once again, the sublime anatomy of the legs another group Traguloid, traguloidea is represented here by nipponopsalis yeosensis it's a japanese form it's tiny delicate but once again it's got these like little jaws and medium-sized eyes and sensor limbs beautiful creature another group traguloidea oh man maybe i made a mistake with the spelling here uh, 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 yeah, I'm missing an eye here, so you gotta forgive me. Traguloidea, it must be an eye here, is represented here by Dicranolasma soerensis. These are like little baked kush meatball kind of reefer kind of guys. They're, they're like indistinguishable from mud. They walk around. Don't smoke one, man. Not good for you, man. Anyways, another, sp another representative, Dicranolasma. They look like animated pieces of uh, coal pat, but they're just beautiful. And another group, another representative is Trogulus. Uh, this is a really nice, memorable photo for me because it's a photograph that I took in the garden of a hotel in summer vacation. I first thought it must have been a like, giant mite or something, but turns out it's just this very rare kind of opilion. And <laughs> I was just happy to have photographed one. It moved really slowly. It was a really interesting creature, not gonna lie. And then you get to this big group called Insidiatores. And uh, among them, there are many subfamilies or families. And here's one family, Travunoidea, rep represented here by Sclerobunus non dimorphicus. I guess it's not dimorphic. Once again, you get the jaw arrangement with the front limbs. Really cool creature. Another one. Holoscoto lemon jacchetti. Well, this is not one lemon you want to put in your tequila, maybe. But it's got these tiny, long, thin fringes. And even though they make it look super predatory, these are probably for capturing very small things. Because if you're like, if you know anything about how mechanics work in animals or otherwise, if you got long, thin things, they're kind of fragile. So I guess it's used for like filtering something or catching some small creatures i don't know moving on mo moving on there's another group called trea trea enonicoidea represented here by the most amazingly named creature of them all futa montana 
Rehendor. It's like one demon and it's like a kind of cave dwelling blind opilion specialized for a cave living existence with this like you see now this is a proper predatory forelimb doesn't have the long teeth you see in this guy just grabs something and eats it and for some reason its legs have these like fork like extensions on the sides I don't know what this is for maybe it's to sense air currents in the cave but your guess is as good as mine and just to make it cooler this guy has no eyes and it's just just beautiful another one from the same group is Synthetonychia just a big fat ass kind of creature not much is known about them another big big group is the Grassatores group uh, which is kind of this this group is fam famous for the triangle shaped bizarre harvest men which kind of like the triangular shape is used to accommodate their big big leg muscles that give them like a jumping ability I believe or they skip somehow J but just amazing this is the Asa Asamioidea subfamily and super family and this is the Asamidae family and this is just sp because we don't know what species or genus it is Another one within this group is Mysorea. Once again, they have illustrated only the body this time, but you can see the gnarly anatomy of the abdomen and the hind limbs. Just, just beautiful. And then you got the Dampetrinae family. You would expect with a name like that for these creatures to have dumper truck asses, but they're just like, they're still fascinating, but compared to other things we've been seeing within this group, they're kind of vanilla. But they're just cool. They're doing their own thing, hanging about and living the good life. Be your best self. Because now this is... I, I can't even find words for this creature. It's not only the best self, it's the best opilion. Perhaps it's the best arachnids, really, of them all. Like, among all these groups we've seen and we're about to see, this thing... The unknown representative of the Epidanidae family, of the Epidanidoi, Epidanoidea group, in the Grassotores group, of the Laniatores clade of Harvestman. I mean, where do I begin? First of all, it's got this Ferrari Porsche Carrera body, slick black grading into red. It's got these scorpion forelimbs, but that's not enough for this motherfucker. It's got to have them all. It's got this kind of single horn, unicorn horn, at, extending from above its eyes. And it's got these, like, two extra long, two T, I don't know, like, forklift construction machine arms. It's just a beautiful animal. Just look at this thing. I mean, if someone drew this as a speculative evolution critter, you know, most people would say, ah, come on, it's just too much. But no, not too much. is, And also, like, the segments of the single body have kind of arranged and shifted in a grid. It's got this triangular body form and this bulbous rear body legs as well. It's just all of the best things in one best animal. I believe God himself incarnates as one of these things and walks about us every day unbeknownst to his or her subjects anyways another group also really cool is the gonileptoidea group represented here by metagonileptes calcar which takes this triangular big booty shake body plan to an extreme and its legs have these spikes it uses for defense it's just amazing and then of course the famous little bunny Harvest Man is also here. Metagreen Bicolumnata is also part of the Gonileptoidea group. And it's got these two bunny ear kind of things about its abdomen. No one knows exactly what it does with these. No one knows. Like, the images are, in most cases, all we have about these species. Then, of course, in this group, there are also cave dwellers who have secondarily become blind. You see the, the eyes are like but vestiges of tiny dots. The, the the claws which have this scorpion like abstraction here they're like small and round but you can still see the claws the body still has a triangular shape it's translucent unbelievable what are you doing man 
Just, just what are you doing? Close your computers. You're all going home. After seeing this thing, nobody can create speculative evolution or any kind of creature art because the game's done. The best creatures have already been designed by Oteoleptes Marcellae and their relatives, their amazing, amazing relatives. Anyways, more more gonileptoids. Sarmacia is another sp species, Sarmacia lucasae. This might be a male, it's got these bulbous limbs, I don't know what it does with them. And it's got these like little spikes and triangular body form and these big, big legs once again. And if that was not heavy metal enough, here is a picture of one eating a velvet worm. And under the UV light, it glows just like a scorpion. Maybe that's why they're classified as, classified as close to scorpions, but I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. And then any, another, another, uh, this group, Gonileptoidea, another amazing creature here is Eutimesus punctatus, spotted everywhere with, in its claws, in its little claws. It's got these like tentacle-like sensor limbs, plus these like spots here and the spikes here. It's just off, off. I mean, look at it from the side. Do you see how enormous these pulps are? And this is a real creature. Unbelievable. Anyways, another species, Steno stignellus, once again has these big ass coconut kind of bulky pulps and the sensor legs, and it's uh, taking care of its eggs, but it also got these hairy legs, it's just. Pew. And then here is another one, Disco Sirtanus, uh, being held by a person. And I mean, just look at this. It looks like some something created by one of those AIs. You know that new new AI fantastic art tool, Mid Journey. It's look it looks like a Mid Journey creation come to life, but the only journey that created it is the journey of natural selection. How beautiful! Disco Sirtanus sp. Another Disco Sirtanus. Look at them. They're like the triangulest and the baddest legist baddest leggiest and spikiest of them all i mean the the leg inserts to the body with this really enormous joint and the joint itself has two spikes and <laughs> and then in the palangoidea group is uh, another semi-blind species named Med megasina it's unbelievable but compared to what we've seen it kind of looks tame it's also very tiny like less than a few millimeters long and then in the Phalangodoidea group, you also have these ones, Stexella. They're blind, soiled, or cave dwellers. They're just walking about. And then in the same group, you have the infamous Dicranopalpus ramosus. I also photographed this. Uh, I mean, it was during when I was visiting London. And you know, in London, in terms of urban fauna, it's uh, really poor. You don't get to see much. I mean... You don't get to see any living creature aside from humans, pigeons, and a few pitiful plants. They allow them allow them to live. Of course, they got parks, but in the urban parts of the city, there's practically no urban wildlife. Except for these guys. I, I noticed them near my door, and I was like, ah, okay, uh, a, 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 an opilion, a harvest man. But then when I took this macro photo, they had these amazing clothes once again. So the crazy geometries here, you know, you can still find them reproduced in this group in some of the most mundane parts of the developed Western world. And another group here in the Grassa Torres group is Samoidea, rep represented here by this member of the Podoctidae family. It's spiky hairy and it just walks about and it's got these head spikes i don't know what it's trying to do but it certainly knows and then you got the sandocanoidea group represented here by gnomulus once again hearkening back to that gnarly mite like body plan but it's more derived than the earliest ones we saw because it's got these like specialized pulps and limbs once again it's just just beautiful something like a rubber japanese toy from a coin-op vending machine forgotten in 1993. 
And then another representative of the Sandokani Noidea group is this one, photographed by the amazing Melvin Yeo. He's a great macro photographer. Look up his work. He's all over the place, basically. But just look how nice and rubbery this animal looks. And the eyes hide a wisdom of eons. Unbelievable. And then also in the Sandokanoidea group is Stignoma spiniferum, notable for its spiny forelimbs. And once again, no eyes. This thing lives in a cave once again. Whenever arachnids go into caves, wonderful things happen. And then in the Zalmoxoidea group of the Z Grassatores lineage, you have the family Zalmoxoidae, which is represented by creatures that look like this. I don't know, but the color, the spikes, everything exactly looks like a creature named Zalmox would look like. There's the parallelism between names and the shapes conjured up by their autosuggestion. There's that for you. And then in this group, you also have this genus named Ecaleptes. It's basically like squarish shaped with spiky forelimbs once again. And then you also have another cave dweller known as Guasinia. And it's just blind and it's just beautiful. With this image, uh, all this talking makes me a bit tired. Okay. With this image, I always see like these things not as close, but basically like the bird like head of a big fat body creature. And it's just fascinating. And of course, that's that for our brief survey of the Opilions group, Harvest Men, harvesting none other than human souls. Souls. Anyways, in art history, this group is sadly underrepresented, uh, underrepresented, except for the works of the like OG surrealist Salvador Dali. Love him or hate him, he was a very talented painter. His personality was a bit, you know, out there. Was a bit full of himself, you know. But you know, he was also the like the son of a very rich family, but. There are also many sons and daughters of many very rich families and they don't do jack shit. And at least Salvador Dali chose this life for him and it's all good. And in his works, Dali realistically painted these opilions. These are the common harvest men you can find all over Europe and Asia basically. But they're always there. Here, one another picture. This is not a spider, it's distinctly an opilion. I mean, Dali was a very keen observer of nature. Uh, even though he was like a complete surrealist, he was really keen on looking at the world and interpreting it. And then, of course, the famous uh, many jointed legs that he draws these animals with in, in his Temptation of St. Anthony series, they're directly derived from the spindly, whip-like limbs of opilions. And here is another sketch. Like this, I guess it's a woman opilion, I guess. And she's going crazy. And it's like, oh, who is this, honey? And it's like, ah, don't mind her. She'll go away. Not just hanging about. Anyways, then that was it for Opilions. Here we have another group. The Phalangiotarbi group, which is extinct. Known from a few, a few fossil remains of this one particular species, Goniotarbus angulatus. It's got this kind of two body segments rapidly coalescing into one, I guess, and r very faintly opilion-like limbs. And in a 3D scan, it comes out as this kind of creature. Maybe it's related to one of those ancestral opilions, but no one knows. Goniotarbus angulatus. Then you get to this other group, this still extant group of uh, pseudoscorpions, the small, uh, the small little scorpions basically the scorpions without tails you can find them all over the place but they're really really tiny so you can you have to look really carefully but you know if you look in the like in leaf litter or something wherever in the world you're most likely to find them they are in this part of our group they're like distinct from opilions and scorpions but remember this this classification changes every five years but I'm just using it because it was the most convenient one. If it's not the most up-to-date one, apologies. If you're a like genuine arachnologist and not a rambling YouTuber man like me, please feel free to correct me. 
But basically, they're not as diverse as opilions, but they still come in a lot of groups. And here, they're not extremely diverse, so we can review them family by family. I mean, basically, these are number A, uh, Shernetidae. These are the more convenient pseudoscorpions, let's say. And these one, Ctonius and relatives. You can see they've got these like big secondary claws here. They are the most ancestral or extraordinary ones, the more bizarre pseudoscorpions. And their just classification is just... I mean, every five years there's a genetic study, cladistic study, a revision, or like like some people put their life's works into these things and basically make it easier for all of us to understand. And traditional groups are split and put in different places, but anyway, it's just a big, big mess. But let's begin with the most uh, quote-unquote ancestral family, the Kton Ctonioidea group of the pseudoscorpions, represented here by Ctonius Isknochiles, is Isknochiles, and it's just really tiny, but also really arcane. It looks like something from Skull Island, but it's really tiny. I ho I wish these guys got bigger. Another species, Ctonius tenuis, almost spider-like body, in fact, with the claws and the secondary claws here. Then you got Lechitia, which is a New Zealand species, also really tiny, but I mean, look at it. It's not a scorpion, not a spider. Dare I say, not a proper pseudoscorpion. It's just its own thing. And I just love creatures like this. And then we get to the more convenient groups, the Neobisioidea group and the Neobisidae family under it. Who knows what species this is, but it's how it rolls, basically. And then you got the cave living ones, of course. You can never get too many cave arachnids. And whenever they go into caves, regardless of which group they come from, they elongate and do strange things to their bodies. So this is Neobisium spal spelaeum, the cave Neobisibisi pseudoscorpion. The little current sensing hairs and long claws is just beautiful and surreal, unbelievable. I imagine this was a glass sculpture through two meters tall. Wouldn't that be the best artwork in the world? Anyways, you got another gr group or family, Ideoroncidae. Once again, a cave dwelling group, eyeless, just with long claws and spider-like bodies. And then you got the famous genus Roncus albulli, which is red and just dashing. Just look at it. It's like a gummy bear. Mm. And then you got the Bokikidae group, which once again has taken this elongation to surreal extremes. This is a cave dweller once again. And then you got the Tartarocreagris genus, which is also similar. But once again, you got cool names for cave-dwelling animals. Tartaros from hell, Infernalis, as if that wasn't hellish enough. You also get the Infernalis name. And then you get to the Garipoidea group, which is like... You can see how they are different from the other groups. And they are more rounded bodies, smaller front parts, and more tick-like body form. This is Garipus californius. And then the record holder, the largest pseudoscorpion of them all garipus titanius is in this group this guy lives in ascension island which is like in the middle of nowhere in the south atlantic it's this amazing lovecraftian island you know i mean just if you look at its photographs it looks like a beautiful surreal landscape painting so this very isolated place somehow these garipus pseudoscorpions came there and became giants to make the story more interesting the island is also home to a british base of airplanes and radars which in the 70s and 80s used to host this amazing fleet of v bombers the nuclear british delta wing bombers and you know everybody divides these life stories into different bits you know you could look at it from a military history perspective, never know about the scorpions. You could just 
study the pseudoscorpions and never know about the British nuclear bombers and what they did there during the British Argentine Falklands War. But it's just amazing. Isn't this like, I mean, who needs weird fiction? Who needs science fiction? Who needs Lovecraft or like any of those others? Like, who needs it when you got reality is like this? An island in the end of, at the end of Earth, host to arcane nuclear bombers, death machines, and among them live the mightiest giants of a once proud, forgotten lineage. Imagine nuclear war breaks out and these planes and these pseudoscorpions are all that survives. It's just like I'm just rambling, but here's my lesson for you. When you're looking at something, it could be an animal looking to its habitat or looking to whoever who discovered it, looking to the year it was discovered in. I mean, always create these links between the sciences or social sciences, art or other things. And, you know, it will make you a more aware person, a more entertaining person. I mean, it will really broaden your horizons. Don't stay limited to one discipline. You know, there is these people like, I remember going to this kind of art excursion with a group of nature people and artists. I was among there from the art artist contingent. Anyways, there's these bird watcher guys and they're hyper fixated about the birds. And we're walking in like a forest or something and we see some goats. I said, ah, oh, look, nice goats. And the, their response is like, ah, if it's not a bird, please don't distract me. I, you know, maybe you are a really good bird watcher you sure as hell are missing out on becoming a human being part by limiting yourself thus. Anyways, that was a long side side alley. A Vulcan V bombs. Oh, look, also look at the history of these bombers and look at the history of how the US Air Force silently tried to like mothball them and make them less effective, but it's a whole other story. Then you got the other group, Mentidae family. With uh, known for more elongate bodies, like sausage-shaped bodies, with tiny bit of like a scorpion almost glued on top, amazing creature, and pseudo scorpion with an elongate body collected under a rock in superstition mountains of Arizona. If you watch the first part of this amazing, amazing podcast, oh, how are we gonna go all the way back there? This was not the first we had seen of the Superstition Mountains. There was a group of scorpions living there named Superstitionia. <coughs> so maybe these guys and those little elongated pseudoscorpions. Let's go to full view once more. They all gather under the Superstition Mountains. And have a little tea party. Well, Mr. Scorpion, you want the tea? Yes. I also want the cookie. Give, give, give. Another elongate bodied group under this uh, classification of the pseudoscorpions is the old P. Dye group, and basically what they look like is all we know of them. And then you got the Cheridioidea group, represented here by Cheridium Museorum, the Museum of the Scorpion. For some reason, these guys love living among old paper and old books. Maybe they digest the cellulose, I don't know. But they're really specialized for this dry and uh, inhospitable habitat they've chosen. Their body is leathery and kind of flat, no eyes, just amazing. Another group, Fiaeloidea, represented here by Fiaella Media, on a flat coin-like things. Once again, they look like parasites, but to, to, to my best knowledge, they're not parasites. They just like living, hiding under soil or burrowing, I don't know. Another species in the Fiaeloidea group is the amazing Neopseudogaripus scutellatus, the scutellated... Garipus thing with the long thin claws like you see these claws the tips are really long with sensor hairs but a really bulbous base means it can kind of like 
snap really fast with the action of the fat muscles there. And the hairs ma must make them sensitive to movement. So the moment it touches some small animal, a springtail or something, chat, shuts down like a trap. And then you got the Sternophoroidae group, represented here by the Afrosternophorus longus pseudoscorpion. These guys build nests like with silk, so they're really unique in that respect. And they show parental care. Once more, confirming my personal belief that all arachnids have this high sense of individual awareness which makes them even more charming and beautiful and then in the you have the chelifero chelifero group represented here by atemnus beautiful name they live under sand or soil and just blind wander about familiar story but repeated so many times looks almost like a little water bottle i mean okay then you got the famous uh, another kind of library haunting pseudoscorpion chelifer uh, once again walking among old documents imagine your whole world is a book for godlike monadically locked stupid big mammals to read but you're just living there vibing among the pages who cares if it's low or a book about rocket science or a hard sex novel you don't care you just vibe among the pages reproduce and eat that delicious little delicious little cellulose hit yeah what if our world is like that to some unknown superior beings makes you kind of think huh maybe we are only living in the latest issue of space alien god hustler magazine i don't know anyways cherry fair is also a, an apt hunter here you can see it catching a springtail no this is a springtail this is a leafhopper insect, but it's caught them all right. And then these guys are also known for this like really cute behavior. They latch onto s larger insects and use them for dispersal. They don't hurt them. They're just passengers. I'm just a fellow traveler. I saw what they did, but I did not participate. That kind of thing. This is Lamprocernes from the Shelliferoidea group. And here it's like hanging onto a fly. Actually, I mean, these guys, like, here it looks like they're having this monstrous battle against this gigantic, weevil monster, but no, they're actually hitching a ride on it. Just hanging on and just getting carried along. And this is a surprisingly effective behavior. In fact, the ancestors of these giant Ascension Island pseudoscorpions may have arrived there by hanging on to birds or even insects that flew with the wind. I don't know. Once again, it's doing the. This one is doing the dispersal by latching on. Hold in, hold on for dear life, my brother in Christ. Yes, and then we come to the parasitiforms group, which are a parasite is a very generic generic name. Of course, any creature that enriches itself at the detriment of another is considered a parasite. But this group, basically, basically okay. Once upon a time, used to have a group big called big group called akari mites and ticks but this was an artificial group we now know that ticks and parasitic mites belong to a group called parasitiforms which are somewhat close to false scorpions then you have this whole other group akari forms with all these like velvet mites and dust mites and all those but they're they may be closer related to other arachnids but we'll see more about them later for our purposes we just need to look at this group parasitiforms with ticks and parasitic mites and their relatives and they're a amazingly diverse group i mean i'm just really gonna go skim lightly over them because if i go family by family we'll be here for years i mean this is the kind of diversity that human minds were not meant to comprehend and i kid you not okay and uh, an easy way you can differentiate between parasitiforms and acariforms, we're going to look at parasitiforms now, is that they have these like spike-like chelicera, and the body is called an idiosoma. Um, but these guys, they're just heads basically. But the acaris have like longer, more blobby, baggier bodies, and they got this kind of sensors on their shoulders or something. They're like, when you see them, and when you start looking at them, you'll understand. But here you go, you have the Holotiridae group, first and foremost. 
They are like small predatory mites. They just walk about and suck other little organisms dry. They're just amazing and they're just vibing. Then you got the really dangerous ones, the parasitic ticks, basically. There's many species of them. Most which hurt people are specialized for mammals. And you see how this Selicera here, they have become extremely thick, stout and flat like two knives. You see this guy, for example. I mean, this generic form, they're like, okay, medium size, but this here they're like, boof. And they use them to <laughs> penetrate skin and suck, suck for dear life. And they get huge. And of course, they carry all kinds of diseases, Lyme disease. These are like, we, we've seen many, and we are going to see many potentially poisonous or scary looking arachnids. But these are the only arachnids you should be scared about. They really, I mean, if you go like tumbling in the grass in a kind of um, meadow or a kind of farmland, you should always be careful, like check your legs for these things. In fact, if you're a guy, like shave your lower legs so that like if you're a guy and you like going on trekking and stuff, it might help you to shave your lower legs so that you, it will be easier for you to spot them. And they're not always huge. They can be really tiny and really, really hard to uh, see. So be careful, everybody, ladies and gals. And so if you get this thing called Lyme disease, it really messes you up. You are changed for life. There's no lasting cure. It really messes you up. Anyways, then you got the mesostigmata group of the parasitiform ticks. Well, these are not parasites. They're just hunting mites. They just run about and <coughs> eat these smaller things, which can be anything. This is the kind of life I really like, you know. If I was given a choice to reincarnate as an arachnid, probably would be this, like, basically zoom about and eat small prey. And if something eats you, it happens so fast that you don't even feel the pain. Anyways, here's another species, Sejus toquatus, it's just with these little horns, like running about, predator. You got uh, also... Phytoseiulus persiminis, this, uh, this is a plant-eating variety, if I'm not mistaken. Then you got this group called Opilio Acarida, which, okay, to make things more confusing, remember we had Opilions, harvest men, that look like uh, basically ticks. Then you got proper animals in the tick group that look like Opilions, and they look like these purple glass abstractions, they're really beautiful, unbelievable, they're just... Din, 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 din. Um, you see, their eyes are kind of where their quote-unquote shoulders should be, but they're just beautiful. Look at it, walk about. What a beautiful creature, Opidia acarus. And then you get to perhaps my favorite group, the really, really, really gnarly, predatory, unbelievable sun spiders, the best arachnids. Perhaps the, even the best creatures or, or the best form of organized matter to exist. Bloop, they are in this part of our classification. They are somehow related to uh, sun spiders. No, they are somehow related to pseudoscorpions. But no one really knows. I mean, the relation is derived from the Kelikera, basically. But they are extremely diverse. And they are all very big, very fast predators. Their jaws basically i mean look exactly like miniature versions of mammal skulls this is a shrew skull and this is a jaws of a little little sun spider so you could say that they have got these like two leopard skulls fused to their bodies and they got amazing fast spider legs and they're like hyperactive carnivores the likes of which you have never seen before and some even have pincers that resemble leopard skulls they're out of this world so beautiful also this is an, this was one another one of those little details that convinced me that if we ever see alien lives we might see similar anatomical adaptations like there will be things with mouth parts that look like mammal predators or spider predators but they would be derived from completely different organs but nature in a weird way rhymes and it's just when you realize this level of, let's say, rhyming, it really takes you to beautiful, beautiful places. And of course, and they're just so gnarly 
they always remind me of this amazing Nicki Minaj song only which I under these circumstances cannot sing but you know you got things like sun spiders only bite spiders only fat spiders only eat your face spiders only Doosh. chunk spiders only slim spiders only mate spiders only get your chunk on spiders only I got the sun spiders in here tonight only look at this isn't this the best creature on earth look at it this eyes flash in the dark it's just hairy full-on predator it's just a Nietzschean vision almost like the will to consume and the will to hunt personified and they're just so beautiful Doom, ding, ding. and they got many many subfamilies and we're gonna review them all let's go okay first we got the Ammotrechidae family they're like the sun sand dweller something Ammo means sand in latin or greek if i'm not mistaken and they're just look at this little birdie beaks and little eyes they and the, when these guys move the face kind of splits into two and moves independently it's beautiful basically these this thing is a like a bicep basically and this hood here is actually the top of its eye supporting skull almost so you might say the head the face is here these are like two bicep kind of things that are closely aligned with the skull anyways these the anatomy of these animals i can't have enough of these sun spiders really uh, another example of the Ammotrechidae family these are like anatomically conservative but you'll see some good surprises you see the big big four limbs you, they got 10 limbs so the, these are pedipalps that have been adapted for running preclobis patagonicus from patagonia this unknown beautiful thing with the bird-like head you got gaucha avexada which is uh, probably named after the avesta which is an old old epic i don't know though but just i'm just look at it as an artist the, the observe the beauty of their colors the beauty of their body shapes and just the beauty ob observe their beauty and weep you know then you got the Ceromidae group, which is kind of like smaller, tinier, and more shy, introverted looking ones. I guess these are the ones that like to listen to lo-fi music on big fat headphones. But the Ceromidae group is also known from extinct species, such as Kratasolpuga wunderlichi, known from these fossils. They're just unbelievable. The Kratasolpuga is from the early Cretaceous, by the way. Of course, you know, five years later, someone might take another look at this fossil and determine it's actually not a salt, salt, salt fuge. It's something else. But, you know, for the time being, it's classified under this group, the Ceromidae group of the sun spiders. Then you got Daesidae, Daesh, Aman, and uh, they're kind of like long, big camel faced ones. And they're just really oof, unbelievable. They walk about, run about, long slim spindly limbs and hunt uh, you got also this one blossia which unlike these unnamed species it's camouflaged with the sand so it's just really beautiful you got the eremobatidae group which is once again with long legs the, these classifications are done by looking at the structures of their genitals and their lungs and their sense organs so it's all a bit like difficult to understand from their appearance alone you got from the Eromobatidae group, you got Eromocheris bilobatus. Look at the jaws. It's like it, it's like it's screaming all the time. What does it scream? It screams the unintelligible name of God. Then you got the Galeodidae group, which are like more chunky and gnarlier. Galeodes is one of the, an example, and it's a good mother. It's taking care of its eggs. Its, its body is full of eggs. And then you got Galeodes graecus. When I was a kid, I found a big sun spider. I, I, my, my parents took me and my brother to a hotel. It was a kind of like seaside vacation spot kind of hotel. Uh, it was in a remote part of the country. So uh, one morning I found a sun spider on uh, basically in front of our room. Put it into a bottle. I just parading it around. And it was really cute. Like it was going 
it makes this kind of sound and it's like clicking its jaws about. Then this asshole from the hotel, I'm sorry to say, but this kind of like this F word person like, took upon his duty and he was so convinced, like any of those idiots who don't know jack shit about natural history, he was so convinced that I had caught the most poisonous spider and could kill not only me, but everyone else in that hotel. So for a whole day, he, he chased me. I ran away from him with the spider in, the, in a bottle in my hand. And basically, he tried to get me to give the spider to him so he could kill it. But of course, I didn't, I did no such thing. I went out of the hotel and threw the spider into the sun spider into some bushes. And then I went to this asshole. I said, I released it near the swimming pool. And then for two whole nights, these assholes kept looking near the swimming pool for the supposedly dead the sun spider. Serves them all right. I hope they all had like this kind of stupidity. I'm a really chill person, but this kind of stupidity I cannot condone nor tolerate or respect. Anyways, that was a story. Then you got the Galeodos Hakkariensis, which is uh, from the Hakkari province in eastern Turkey. It's kind of my burlier, kind of darker colored variety of the uh, Graesus species, which is from, I guess, western Anatolia and Greece. And then you got the Glipidae family, which is like also chunkier and fl uh, flat, flatter, but unlike the lo-fi looking Ceromidae group, they kind of have something wild about them. I mean, look at it. You know, these guys have spunk, let's say. Gilipus Cyprioticus, unbelievable creature. And then you got the cutest of them all, Hexisopodidae. These basically are sun spiders that have become really hairy and managed to do their best to turn into little chunky furry teddy bears with little tiny jaws. I mean, look at it. These are the eyes, these are the jaws, hair all over the place. Eeh! They're digging, they're like moles, I guess. And this is what they look like. Almost abstract, but here are the two eyes. The hair collects the sand, so it camouflages them. And these are so good. It's almost like a rodent skull, don't you think? Look at these two projections with the jaws and all that. And you don't even have species name for, names for many of these. They got these chunky legs. I, I like the wild and savage species but the hexisopodidae group of the sun spiders has a dear place close to my heart and the rear legs have become these shovel like things like they use them to dig backwards basically beautiful then you got the karshidae family represented here by karshia zarutni unbelievable once again i believe these are a uh, eurasian species then you got the melanoblosidae family which are just not much is known about them other than the fact that they're awesome one of the most awesome sun spiders of them all, Dinorax rostrum psitaki, the red parrot giant mega killer ultra special deluxe sun spider comes from this group. Some call it blood red sun spider, but it's just beautiful. Look at it. Half of its body is jaws. And and look, they got also these like little teddy, like kitty cat claws. And then you got these big claws. Like, uh, if you're, like, into speculative creature art, I suggest, like, spend one day studying one of these animals. Don't look at one picture, but look at several pictures of the same species and try to draw it. The anatomy is more complex than you think, and when you master it, you really learn a lot. Dino, Rax, Rostrum, Psittak, isn't this amazing? Then you got the Mumujidae group, which, I guess... Is named after the sounds people make upon seeing them. Heck, I mean... Uh. And then here is Mumusia Ibira Pemusu. Nice name and nice stripy color arrangement. And then you got another really good, really good family. The Ragodidae family. These are like the chunkiest, burliest, most predatory. These guys are specialized for digging. Not as much as the Hexisopotidae, the little chunky flat mole teddy bear flapjack things. But these guys are more like a digging kind of parrot beaked dealer of death. Eat your face and cleave it into two with their legs and don't even stop for 
goddamn nothing kind of family. Drago this. Look at this. Look at this. Oh, oh, unbelievable. This is the. This is not only the best expression of arachnid evolution. It's just the, also the best expression of existence. Period. I mean, this is to God what God is to a microbe. Look at it. I'm sure when I pass on, uh, the, the universe will appear to me in this format. Maybe it already has. Rago this. Look at it. Off, off. And there's also like amazing varieties of these living in Iran and India. Not much is known about them because of the difficulty of reaching where they live and uh, various political or education related situations. But off, off, off. Eat on, eat on, brother. Eat that moth. No one deserves it more than you do. And, you know, I've grown past the stage of my life. I don't want to keep exotic pets anymore because it's, well, bad for the animals. And, you know, but I would really, like, if forced to choose, I would love to have these guys as pets. Oi, oi, look at this. Unbelievable. It's no wonder. When Indians saw visions of Vishnu and those multiple armed gods and goddesses, they must have seen one of these. Eh, just joking. And another group, Sol Pugidae, Sol Pugida, the quote-unquote proper sun spiders, represented here by Sol Puga Villosa, and the beautifully named Zeriasa. Zerias, look at that purple sheen. You go, girl. Anyways, and then Zeria, another beautiful name. Zeria Strepsikeros. And then Metasol Puga Picta with the little hairs. Uh, this, these guys live in the driest deserts, I believe. And this is why they have this like fringe of hairs. Maybe it helps them accumulate moisture or like protects against the sand or both. But they also have got the like orange touch me not head. And it's just <sniffs> like uh, so at the end of this chapter, you know, these sun spiders, they're not extremely well represented in art. But there's a good chance that, you know, these Nazca drawings, they're like one of the genuine enigmas of the archaeological world. They're these enormous drawings of animals and plants and shapes that can only be seen from the sky. And like one of those drawings there, it's termed a spider. But there's a good chance it might actually represent one of these guys. But the jury's out. Certainly the jaws are there and it's just, just beautiful. The Nazca lines, by the way, they're like genuine, unexplained archaeological phenomena. You know, I mean, there's a high probability that these people were somehow able to build hot air balloons and use them to observe these lines on the ground. But no one knows. Then you get to Palpi Grady. Palpi! It's the little known. Blink! Palpi grades, they are called micro whip scorpions. They are not very diverse, but they're extremely fascinating. They basically they basically live all over the world. They got these little whip-like tails with hairs on them. They look like kind of these spiders with ten legs, but also with salicera. They lack eyes and they are very, very little known. Main there's there's two main groups of them. One is Eukoenini Eukoenenidae, represented here by Leptokoenenia pelada. Another Eukonenid palpigrade here represented by Eukonenia. Oh god, my tongue. And then you got the Prokoenenidae group represented here by Prokoenenia Vileri. I mean, how to classify them is probably known only to like the 10 or so experts in the world that know about these things. Really, there's like such a paucity of information about them. And one second, if you want to pursue a career in zoology or arachnology, go study these guys. You won't be disappointed. Prokoenenia vileri again and again. And not much more about them, but they were cool, were they not? Then we get to the Trigonotarbida group, another one of those little extinct groups that are not only from fossils. I mean, some people classify them close to the base of the family tree that begets the proper spiders, the Araneae. And boy, aren't these guys a handful. But they're represented by this guy, Eufrinus Previsti Prestvisi. And 
They are just cool. Then you got the Urara Uraraneida group. Once again, known only from a few umber trapped spe species. They're basically spiders with little tails. So more closely related to maybe, I don't know, scorpions or similar to those Prochoenenia kind of things with this thing. I don't know. They're only known from these amber fossils and some stone fossils, I guess. Permarachne. And then we get to spiders proper. But boy, is this going to be a huge group. So we're going to tackle this in part three. This has been the end of the second part of the CEM Kozeman Pan Arachnid Giga Special. Please let me know in the comments which one your favorite arachnid was. And please don't forget to subscribe to this channel. And please, please, please don't forget to support me on Patreon.com. See you in part three, Arachno Chads. Goodbye.